Welcome to the GCN Tech Show. This week, we're discussing what is going on with pro cyclists gearing. Why are they always massive now? We also have some out of this world expensive wheels. SRAM have filed a solar charging patent. KMC have developed a budget friendly cassette. And there also appears to be a glimmer of hope that the bike industry is recovering from its post COVID crash. <sighs> Peyton's Patent Patrol. <laughs> Can't wait. We also have hot tech in the bike vault. So what is going on with the chain rings that the pros are using? They all seem to be massive now. Yeah, so this is something that I saw at the Tour Down Under at the start of this year. Something that we've observed in previous years when we've gone to bike racing. and just generally seems to be evolving a little bit over time with pro races. Yeah. But the, the thing to point out here is this isn't just time trial chain rings we're talking about. Because <laughs> they big time trial dinner plates, you know, 60 tooth <laughs> chain rings used by the likes of Filippo Ganna. They've been around for quite a long time now, and we sort of understand that there's the whole thing about optimizing your chain line and, and all that sort of stuff. But we're noticing now in just all races, even races that are hilly and going up hills, they're using much bigger rings. So pro gears seem to have got much larger, but conversely, amateur gears seem to have got a little bit smaller. So how come we've ended up in this situation? So typically, in the past, you know, pros ran 53, 39 chain rings, and that's why they were called standard gearing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and that was what they did. And then bike brands created uh, 5034, the compact chain set, which was designed to be easier gears for amateurs. The everyday rider. Yes. Um, however, now that, like, well, all the brands have switched to 12 speed, you look at, say, Shimano. Yeah. That 5339 isn't really available at 12 speed well, now. I don't I can't think it even exists. Yeah, I don't yeah. think it exists. Um, what you do see, though, is they're selling a 5440. Yeah. And that's become a much more popular chain set for professional riders. Yeah, I think that's the route that Shimano have gone down, right? So they've offered that smaller chaining size for what's deemed to be amateur riders. And other brands have followed suit. Remember a few years back, SRAM decided that they wanted to shrink everything down, smaller chainrings, smaller cassettes. And then more recently, Campag seemed to have followed suit with that. But if we go back a few years, you can go back to nearly 2016 when we saw pros experimenting with larger chainring sizes. We had yeah. Garen Thomas, didn't we? 2016 2016 Paris Nice. Paris -Nice. Um, yeah, the descent was coming out the back of Es Village down into Nice, and he thought he might get attacked and dropped by Contador on the climb. He did. And so he, he thought, oh, I'm going to put on a massive chain ring so that I can pedal on the descent and, and pursuit back on, um, which he did. But it was only a 54. But I remember at the time putting a 54 on on what was a pretty yeah. early stage was was newsworthy. But now, a lot of them are running that standard, if not bigger. Yeah, I think we're seeing, like we've got here, Mads Pedersen appears to have like a 56 on his road 43 bike. 43 as a standard on his road bike. Yeah, and that's running SRAM. Yeah. Um, and I spoke to uh, Connor Swift yeah. from Ineos, and, and you know he was saying that he often has just the, the 54 on, but for like that would be his standard. So if he was going into the mountains, he'd run the 54. But, but running, <laughs> yeah. But then, um, but then on flat days or yeah. a sprint day or classics, 55, 56. Because the sort of argument is that, well, and the, just purely by the way the gears work, if you have a massive chaining at the front, that the inner chaining still has to be considerably larger because you can't have that huge jump between them. Yeah. But the question is. Like, you know, okay, we've observed this, and this isn't just those guys. Then We haven't picked isolated examples. <laughs> no. These bigger chain rings are now endemic throughout um, the pro peloton. But the question is why? Okay. Like, why are we seeing much bigger chain rings now? Well, I mean, common sense says it's purely down to the speeds of bike races, right? So we've said this before. Over recent years, bike racing is just getting faster and faster and faster. So with that concept in mind if the racing is getting faster you're going to need gears that are going to enable you to ride faster surely yeah i think like if you look at the tour de france is like is a good yardstick isn't it the average speed of the last two tours de france was um like 43 kph average in 2022 Correct. and like 41 or 42 kph average in like last year 2023 39 kilometers an hour in 2010 
We've, we've seen an upward trend here. Yeah. So yeah, 39 in, in 2010. And there are things that affect it because the, the amount of climbing in the race differs a lot and, and all the rest of it. But you do, if you plot everything, you see a general trend. You know, in the 80s, it was like 38 kph average and, and, and yeah. so on. So it, what you're seeing there is is technology making the racing faster because, well, I mean, if you're cynical and you say other things are making the racing faster, then, well, there's that's always happening as well. But the, the point <laughs> is, is the racing is getting faster um, and technology is playing a part because, you know, we have far more aerodynamic bikes, more aerodynamic wheels, yeah. more aerodynamic clothing, more aerodynamic... All the stuff that we just tires, always, rolling resistance, all the stuff we always bang on about, yeah. basically. It all does add up, and you know. So I did a little bit of research this morning, whilst you were probably still fast asleep because I wake up early and research these things. Um, one tooth extra on a chain ring on a twenty-eight millimeter tire equates to approximately one point one kilometers an hour higher higher speed for the same cadence. So. Right. 53 to a 54 you're gonna go one one point one comps hour like faster so you can like follow the you can always follow the chain ring size up with the trajection trude- can't get the word out that the speeds have increased yeah it's th- th- there is a problem though yeah <laughs> so it's all good and well having the faster race speeds yeah and then having these bigger chain rings it's all great until you get to a hill <laughs> because then your bigger chain ring does become it's a problem for everyone in life, yeah. I think. You get to it. <laughs> yeah. But then the other thing that we've then seen that's allowed for these sort of bigger chain rings to happen is, again, and, and the pros are a great example of this, is the widespread adoption of bigger cassettes. Yeah. So uh, Shimano 12-speed, great example. You know, they have pretty much just two cassettes that they tend to sell the most. So they have the 1130. Yeah. And they have the 1134 on your ace. Um, and... The pros are pretty much running that 1134 cassette all of the time now because it just, it's, it, you know, I mean, I have it on, you've run it as well. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's such a great all round cassette because it's, it's kind of like having an 1130, 11 speed cassette, but then you've just got that extra one on the end. Yeah, it's, it's meaning that you haven't got those huge jumps between the gears, yeah. and that's when you feel like you're don't quite have the gear that you want. So I've actually also done some research on how other gearing has affected the speed. Just to look at, say, climbing gears, right? Yeah. So go back a handful of years to whenever we were deeming that the so-called standard chain set was a thing. 39 in a ring, most people would have had a 28-tooth cassette in that kind of era, say 15 years ago, for yeah. say. Um, at 85 RPM, that's a speed of 15.1 kilometres an hour. Right. Now, if we look at the gear in the... We're saying the larger chain rings, but because it's tied in with that big cassette, 42 chain ring on the front, 34 at the back, 85 RPM, 12.8 kilometers an hour. So they're getting that increased range of going slower and faster. Yeah. So they've got a bigger gear range now, yeah. even with those monster chain sets, but it means yeah. that they can go a lot faster on descents and stuff. I think all I think another valid point is you know, descending speeds have got a lot faster. If you watch old like Races, you know, we're talking like Greg LeMond era, mm-hmm. Bernardino era. The way in which they descend is is different in like mountain stages. Disc brakes compared to now. Well, not <laughs> no, I'm just not just. Out. Well, no, it, it, disc brakes do play a part, but also, you know, the brakes that they had back then were pants. Like I, yeah. we, I've ridden these old bikes down yeah. hills, and they were pants, and so you can just see the speeds at which they're going, and they don't, they weren't wearing helmets. You know, and the speeds at which they're going on the descents is a lot less compared to, say, you know, Pidcock when he attacked in the tour. And, you know, that too a lot is somewhere where you will utilise a bigger chain ring. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Um, but the other thing we need to mention is that while the pro gears have got bigger, the gears that are often sold to the public have got smaller. So, you know, you look at um, like the... Well, SRAM and Campagnolo offering, yeah. say, 48 tooth chain rings instead of the, the 52. Yeah, I think it's a case that it is an improvement for the consumer, I'm going to say. So, bikes that are generally sold to the public now, I feel, are supplied with far more appropriate gearing for the type of rider that is going to be buying it. You know, we've talked about 53, 39, however many years ago. The majority of people, let's face it, that probably wasn't the optimal cassette and chainring size for them. Yeah, I think that's true. I think the chainrings are good for um, 
like you know mortal riders. Yeah. But what I would like to see is the likes of SRAM and Shimano supplying the bigger cassette option. So it seems that when you buy like a SRAM a yeah. twelve speed group set, the standard cassette that comes with a bike is the ten thirty. And the standard cassette that comes on Shimano's is the 1130. Mm -hmm. But they both, well, SRAM have, what, the 1033 and Shimano have the 1034. Well, you go and 105, you've got a 36. Well, yeah. <laughs> but I feel that that bigger cassette should be the standard option because I just feel that in every case that's the much more versatile, unless you live somewhere really flat. Yeah. But they're so much more versatile. They just, you know, you don't have to worry about ever changing your cassette out. You know, they just do it all. There's also this other sort of element I want to add in, which I... Just pure speculation here. If manufacturers make gears smaller, which means it's better for people to ride at slower speeds, it conversely, well, it kind of helps reduce the weight overall of the group set as well. Like it's like an additional selling point. It's like now lighter than it yeah. used to be. If so, you mean a weight wheel, yeah, the, yeah. the, the eleven thirty is a bit lighter. Yeah, than there the you go. For, but. Um, well, that's our thoughts on it, isn't it? Um, yeah. I think it'd be interesting to hear what kind of gear range people have on their bikes. So let us know in the comments section down below. And as always, we can discuss it next week. It's time now for Hot Tech, and there's a lot of outrageous stuff out this week. Right, yeah, first thing that we're talking about are these new limited edition, lightweight, Meilenstein Evo wheels, which are, like, basically, they're out of this world of pricing. You just ride about the Zwift like 10 times, and you get them for free. I can't even afford them in Zwift. Let me tell you the price <laughs> first, because that's the headline thing here. £7,699. I can't believe I'm sat here saying that with a straight face. Okay. Um, but this, hear me out here. So these wheels are released to pay homage to the company's founder, Heinz Obermeier. 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 I struggle with the name. So there's going to be 99 sets available, aptly named, the Obermeier Evo Signature Gold Edition wheels. And I love that this has been mentioned in the press release, right? To ensure that um, people have got a chance to purchase these wheels... There's 33 sets which are going to be distributed between Europe, Asia slash Pacific, and the Americas. So they're distributed evenly across That's the pair of them. Yeah, so they've got a gold, 24-carat uh, gold leaf across the logo. Wow. Which I think is really cool. $7,000 worth of gold. I've done some research on this. 24-carat gold loose leaf, 8 centimetres by 8 centimetres square, 25 sheets, £30. Right. Just make your own wheels. <laughs> I don't know. Well, that but, is, uh, yeah, that is outrageous. Uh, the interesting thing about the, that particular wheel is it still retains that V-shaped cross section that we now know to be not very good. Yeah, they've been renowned for being super lightweight. Like Ineos, kind of always reverted to those wheels when they were in their, I don't know, Tour de France heyday. Light and stiff. Yeah. That's what they are. Um, One thousand three hundred eighty grams for the pair, forty-eight millimeters deep, and. If you've got incredibly deep pockets, you can go and find them online. Right. Next solar up. shifting next. So, right. I don't know much about the solar shifting. <laughs> shall I, shall I hit, explain? Hit us with this. Oh, this is a new SRAM patent, right? Yeah, so it's... Remember oh. Peyton's Patent Patrol? I have to redo that one up. Um, so, basically, SRAM have filed a patent for solar charging to enable you to charge the SRAM access batteries... On the go. It kind of does what it says on the tin, right? Um, so it says they could charge between 6 and 8.4 volts in direct sunlight, and they've got it, the patent is showing it either in a bottle cage mount with the solar cells on it, or also on a front and rear mug guard. I think the idea behind it... kind of looked it, like a, an ass saver. <laughs> yeah, it kind of did. I think the idea behind it is that you're charging uh, like an additional battery that's on the bike rather than charging the one that's on the deradius. Otherwise the solar charger would have to be connected to your derailleurs, which kind of defeats the whole point of SRAM having wireless gears, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, I don't know. I get it if you're going on big, crazy, epic adventures where you're going to be in the middle of a desert for, like, two weeks, but if you're in a desert for two weeks, maybe electronic gears aren't most suitable for you anyway. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, <laughs> though. It's pretty cool that they're thinking about this. It is cool. I think the, the Fizo Electric uh, generated one on the shifters that yeah. had a pattern for would be cool. I think it's considerably better than my wind powered generator. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. That was pretty good. <laughs> um, Do I detect a slight bit of sarcasm there? <laughs> no. So we, we also have another outrageously priced um, object. Yep, go on. 
Yeah. ASOS have unveiled a new skin suit um, ahead of the Paris Olympics. Yeah. So this is important. You know, we've spoken about this before. There's this kind of UCI stipulation that the equipment has to be for sale, uh, otherwise you can't use it, and it has to be approved by the UCI's Equipment Commission. Yeah. So ASOS's new Fenox skin suit can be yours for seven thousand dollars. Oh, you get it at the same time as getting your wheels. Imagine if you ripped. <laughs> imagine. If you rode that and then you fell off the first time you rode it. I don't want to imagine that. I'd be, I'd be the worst. You would, I think I would actually cry. Um, it's, it's, they're saying it's 100% custom. I mean, you'd hope so. Yeah. Um, I should point out as well that for that price, it is also included in a package where you get overshoes. <laughs> oh, that sounds great value now. As well. Um, and it's, it's, you know, apparently just super, super optimised. But I think it's that classic thing... Where and we've seen this time and time again every time the Olympics comes around, yeah. you know, like the Lotus bike and all the rest of it. They 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 make this stuff and then they deliberately overinflate the price. Like we spoke about a few shows back with the um, uh, thing factor, the factor, the track, factor bike. track bike for the Olympics. All brands are doing it. I mean, fair game if that's the if that's where you want to get around the rules. Yeah. Such is life because they just don't want other federations to. Buy it, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it before the games. Okay, well, having spoken about some crazy expensive tech, let's talk about something that's a little bit more friendly price. This cassette from KMC. Ooh. They've launched and developed their own cassette, like KMC, renowned for making chains. So now they've made a cassette which is suitable for like gravel and a large ratio road cassette. I guess. How many speeds we're we talking? Eleven and ten. So no twelve speed option yet, but you assume that's maybe in the pipeline. Mm. So. Like all cassettes out there, they've optimised the ramps and the shifting sort of pins and angles for shifting up and down the cassette. But the cool thing about it that I think is that it's priced particularly reasonably. $65. I think that's pretty good, right? Good price for cassette. Yeah. Um, you've got 11 to 42, 11 to 50, and in 10 speed, you've got 11 to 36 and 11 to 42. So, and what sort of level is this cassette? In terms of, like, if you were to put it in a group set hierarchy. Well, I haven't got any, like, information on the weights here, but taking the basis of price to be one of the easy ways to categorise products, I think it's towards the mid-budget-friendly option. So I think I, I think it's a good thing to have. Yeah. More options for people, basically. Yeah, definitely. Um, um, what? Oh, I'm trying to lost where I am here. Right, finally, we need to mention the um, oh, yes. slight bit of glimmer of hope, certainly in the UK, for the bike industry... Now, I think it's it's known worldwide. The bike industry is having a bit of a tough time, isn't it? Now, whilst initial doom and gloom might seem like uh, in an article that was published purely on UK bike sales, right? Let me tell you some of the stats. Um, 2023 saw the culmination, um, continuation of the post-COVID downturn in the UK cycling market, um, falling a further 6% on top of a already 18% decline in 2022. But hear me out, there's hope because that... Um, those stats are looking at the whole bike industry overall. If you break that down into road and gravel bikes, they actually saw an increase in sales. So what's the problem? Mountain bikers. Mountain bikers dragging us down. They're dragging us down. <laughs> road and gravel lot, we're fine. Oh, but um, that, obviously that's only UK figures. Hopefully, but gravel's seen the biggest growth. Yeah, gravel's seen 11% growth. Road has seen an 8% growth in 23 compared to 22. Which I think is a good thing. Yeah. And there's hope for everybody. Yeah, let's um, just hope that's that's not just a UK thing and that is part of a wider trend globally. Mm, there you go. Um, more hot and spicy tech next week. Time now for comments of the week. Um, we're going to begin with some comments on the last week's GCN Tech Show. Uh, first one from Peter Slater, 7791. <laughs> um, regarding when we were saying about you should just upgrade yourself yeah. rather than upgrade your bike. Um <laughs> He says, it's like in the car world where forum posters come on and say, what should I upgrade? And the answer is always, tighten the nut behind the wheel. <laughs> it just made me smile. Yeah. 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 Maybe the answer in the bike world is, yeah, upgrade you first, mm. then the bike. Um, at A1 White says, the traditional Dura Ace chain set that you just had lying around. Yeah. Um, the jibe. Is it jibe or jib? A jibe. Jibe. Alex always makes me laugh. Well, I'm glad it made you laugh. Yeah. yeah. What's funny is... I'm not bitter about Alex it at all. Sent, Alex sent me a message this week where he'd been out in town and he saw like a random old <laughs> bike locked up in town and it had a Jura Ace chain set on it and yeah. he made a video of it. And he's like, look, I'm not the only 
wanting us to your ace lying around? That's exactly how I spoke as well. It really it hurts him. It kept, yeah. Yeah, it hurts me. Cut me deep. Yeah. Um, anyway, moving swiftly on. <laughs> Underneath the video we had out the weekend where we were looking at all of the World Tour bikes, um, pro weights, which I think has done really well. Loads of people really keen to hear about the weights of the mm. bikes. Um, we had a comment that says, Alex suggested in this video that the switch to a 28mm tyre to a 23mm tyre in order to save weight. But what about the rolling resistance, they say? I mean, if I remember correctly, Josh from Silka said in one of his videos that a GP5000 compared to a GP4000 saves you the same amount of energy on a 10% climb as losing 500 grams in body weight. Mm. So weight weenies should also be rolling resistance weenies. It's true. There's no good looking at one aspect in isolation. You've got to look at the product overall in all the characteristics. Yeah, and that is another, like we were on about chain rings in this week's show, yeah. but the other big thing is like pro tires just getting wider you know and we've mentioned that before the yeah, yeah. similar thing um cbb uh says actually uh test one of the seven and a half kilogram bikes of alp duez with tubeless tires 28 mil versus an old rim brake bike with 25 mil tubulars, or maybe even 23 mil tubulars, God. and compare the times. Um, it would be a really interesting cool. video um, because. It's a lot of work just to drive there with two bikes I'm just to it. do that I'm and then drive it. home. I'm up for that. I think that's a wicked idea. <laughs> we, get a, we get a bike that is, you know, 6.8 kilos rim brake bike and then yeah. go, right, let's do it. I'm, yeah. Road trip in the summer? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Fair play. I'll decent, hold you to that. You can do the driving. Yeah. Um, right. Underneath our Zero Friction Cycling video, where I went to see Adam while I was out in Adelaide from Zero Friction Cycling, a um, couple of comments. Generally, pretty positive. Some people not so pumped on it, but whatever. Andrew McAllister says, awesome effort to keep an interview with Adam to 15 minutes. The video <laughs> editors at GCN Megabase have definitely earned their pay with this one. He, yeah. he is a talker. He is a talker. He is a talker. But he's very sort of thorough in his approach to lube. Yes. Not what I was thinking, but fair enough. Mm. Um, next comment. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Airwork says, amazing chat. Adam is an incredible source of information and such a friendly, sincere guy. Yeah. I, I'm in just complete agreement. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Nice to talk about yeah. a different subject with someone who's like... Question. An if, expert. if Josh Portner is the lube king, mm. what position is Adam? He's pretty high status within the world of lube. Yeah, like a reserve king. Like a backup. Lord of lube? Yeah, Lord of lube. Yeah? Mm. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Uh, cool. Right, uh, we'll go on from that. We'll go on to this week's bike vault. Right. Um, the bell is primed and ready. Um, as always, the bike vault, you can play along at home if you um, submit your bikes in the upload. I'll link in the description down below. And then, um, well, we get to judge them. Rate them either nice or super nice. Yes, ones. and you can... Oh, yeah, you said the links in the thing. <laughs> Pay attention, will you? Too busy doing a lube joke. I was looking at <laughs> This week, first up, we have Ron Zilla, 86. He got a new bike for Christmas. It is a Cervelo R3. Oof, Ultegra, 8,000 on there. What Need some pedals, eh? Yeah, you're not going to get very far on any pedals. Also, I can see it's Christmas because he's got his Christmas lights attached to that tree bush thing. Bottle cages match the bike very well. I'm a big fan of the colour. I just think, get your pedals on it. He's got Tubalito tubes in there, I think, as well. No? Yeah. Yeah, I think he does. Uh, anyway, <laughs> nice. Yeah. I think this needs a resubmission. Does it? Yeah, I don't want to. You shouldn't be propping it up against that shrubbery. <laughs> Sh shrubbery. <laughs> right, Lucky Pierre next. We'll decide if he's lucky or not. Yeah. Um, with a Scott uh, foil. Rim brake, vision Ooh. wheels, Metron 55s, tan walls. Um, I like nice. it. Yeah, can we see what I mean, it's, it's not in the optimum gear, but... That is super nice. This is one of the early electronic That's, the, that's like the first gen Scott foil. Well, and the um, DI2 external battery. Oh, yeah. Super nice. <laughs> Who's next? Very clean cassette on that one. Uh, M. Vincennes with a dual... <laughs> what, what is this? Hang on. It's a bike. Oh, it's a Colnago. Oh, it's a cyclocross bike. Ooh. I'm not sure what model it is. Um, we don't have that information to hand. It, that is, uh, I think I can go super nice on that one as well. 
Yeah, that's actually really doing it. Tan wool tyres do it for me every single time. Well, it's just, it's well presented. It's a good one. You happy? Yeah. Or white bar tape on a cross bike. Oh, that's brave, isn't it? You mm. just re redo it every couple of Baller. weeks. Baller. Yeah. Um, Juan Monzon is next. Candel, rim brake. What's going on with the saddle angle? What are you thinking on the saddle angle? Um, also, I... They said that they've ridden to an open air carbon mine. Is that not just an open air coal mine? I don't know. Hmm. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> um, now I can't really see what's going on here. Also, the, the way the bottle is being used under the wheel. Yeah, unnecessary. Not no. happy about this. Jaunty angle. Mm. It's not well exposed. I can't see anything. Yeah, yeah. I think there's room for improvement on that one. Yeah. Nice. No. Um, Vignesh. Trek Madonna SL6. Ooh. Oh, I love the colours of this. This is incredible. That is a cool, that's got to be one of the custom painted. <laughs> like Project off, Ones. Project Ones, yeah. yeah. It's a good, good, good colour combo. I do, I do like it. I, oh. The rear, um, the rear derailleur cable housing could probably do a cutting down a little bit. Do you know what? It, uh, there's a, that, that wall looks especially abrasive. <laughs> it does, actually. And the bike is yeah. not pushed up against the handlebar. So it means that your bike... <sighs> yeah. That is just... There's just scratches... You're asking for danger. Scratches yeah. waiting to happen there. If that's a Project 1, you don't well, really While that is there. a super nice bike, we can't give it a super nice because we can't endorse <clears throat> such behaviour. No. Okay, so nice. It's, such flagrant disregard for, for your paint. Right, two left in the bike. Well, this way you like this next one because it's a time trial bike. Bella Soda. Yeah. Oh, a Cannondale uh, Slice. RS. Ooh. <laughs> Have they crashed at the side of the road? On top of their Rudy Helmet, <laughs> uh, TT Helmet, yeah. That has a big dog chain ring as well. Yeah, I think, I mean, what was that taken on? Like a Nokia 3310? <laughs> like... It's like a, what, it, what uh, camera was used to take that picture. It looks like a photo of an old photo. It does. Oh, uh, anyway, we won't. It looks like a, like a World War II photo. <laughs> it's not, it doesn't look that old. It does. It it's does. Cannondale Slice RS is without in World, World War, War II. World War II in colour. They didn't have nice. electronic timing chips in World War II. Nice, yeah. Dan Plummy <laughs> with a Colnago concept. Gold chain fist bump. Go on, thanks. Ooh. That was a weak fist bump. Um, oh, I like this. It's, there's a lot going on the handlebars with the cables and the head unit, and uh, yeah. it just looks a bit busy at the front. It's just a shame about that ch that chain set angle. Yeah. You know, do you know what? I That's got scope to be really it, good. It is, and, and I love the Colnago concept. I think it's a really, really cool bike. Um, Iron Engines was nice. Yanto used to have one, didn't he? But I think it got stolen. <laughs> very specific, I don't know that. It, very nice, uh, but I think that is, that is another bike that could be a super nice, but... We're just going very nice. Yeah. A third category. Right, and on that note, that is the end of the Bike Vault for this week's tech show. Um, Ollie, it's been incredible. Thanks. Same time next week? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll be here. Oh, oh, we'll be... Oh, tech on tour. We're in yeah. Corona next week. We are. We've told everyone our secrets. Videos. Yeah, we'll see um, you in Corona. Corona. Right, see you later. Cheers, bye.